Welcome to the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses all the things that schools may have missed with your hosts, AJ Kuti and Jason Gordon. Hello, all. If you haven't heard of us yet, we are the Reschooled Podcast. We are the show that discusses the things that schools may have not prepared you for. And as the intro said, I am AJ, one half of the hosting duo here. And the other half, probably the better half, at least in academics, it seems. My GPA is a lot lower than his based on these past episodes. Jason, how are you doing? Doing great, AJ. Definitely not the better half, just the other half. (laughs) Yeah, it's this series that we've been on, which is the tips and tricks, has showed me a whole lot about myself and my my past, which I kind of already knew. Um, And it's always a, you know, it's a a, a battle constantly to to continue to improve. Uh, And I think it's what it is for everyone. Uh, The last episode, we talked about this concept, which was the work-life school balance and the importance of having the balance, not that there was one balance better than the other, but just the importance of you acknowledging that there needed to be a balance in some sort of, you know, where you put the weight of that balance is up to you based on your needs. Um, In this one, we're going to be talking about time management, which really ties in with the work-life school balance, at least in in our opinions, it does, because it allows you to, to have that balance. Or if you don't have time management skills, it may have made your balance more of a struggle. Uh, so does that sound good to you, uh, Jason? Absolutely. I'm excited about it. That's, this is something that has occupied a major portion of my life. So <laughs> happy to share what I've what I've experienced. It hasn't occupied squat in my life, at least when I was in college. So uh, this this seems to be more of the tips and tricks seems the tips and tricks series seems to be more of Jason did it at the high extreme, AJ did it in the very low extreme. And we're trying to say, you know, somewhere in the middle is fine. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. I wouldn't prescribe my method to anybody. (laughs) Well, before we jump in though, AJ, let me remind everybody, if you have the opportunity, visit reschool.com. That's reschool with a D, not an ED. Uh, Visit our social media handles. We are reschooled pod. And then of course, on all your favorite podcasting apps, Apple, Google, Spotify, Um, follow us, uh, get notifications when we drop a new episode. And most importantly, on our website, contact us. Let us know what's going on with you. If you have questions that you, for us, that you want to hear us talk about or just things of interest that you'd like to hear us talk about or successes, right? We want to celebrate with you. So anyway, that being said, um, contact us if, if you're so inclined. Absolutely. And I've learned over the past, well, I've been editing a bunch of these podcasts lately. If you're playing the drinking game of the Reschooled podcast, every time we say absolutely, you take a shot. Uh, you're I wouldn't do that. To, it, it, needs do to that be a, it needs to be a very weak <laughs> form of alcohol if you're going to do that. <laughs> we have said absolutely and yeah and but so many times. Uh, but we're getting better, I hope. But let's get into our quick question. And we're just going to stick with the same quick question that we've been doing for the past three episodes. And that's a grade the statement question. And so grade yourself on your time management skills in college. Personally, A plus throughout A plus plus. I was, I I was, I was a monster in that field. Yeah, you were a buster. I can tell. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I was not even close to that. I'm still probably around the what I was for note taking, probably an F, because I, I know in college I had almost zero time management skills. The only time management skills I had was the ones that was pushed on me because of athletics uh, or or of those kind of those kind of things. But on my own. No, I was not a scheduler. I was not somebody. I was the person that called you up 10 minutes before something was going on to say, hey, do you want to go do this? It was not pre-planned. Let's go plan this out for a week in advance. It was, it was, I can't even go get my hair cut planned out. Like it's usually the day of, I'm like, I need to get my hair cut. I wonder if they've got any openings today and they never do. So, well, I can say this, you know, I'm a low structure need person in the sense that I don't want someone giving me structure. I want to create my own structure, but the structure I create gives me comfort. Okay. And to the extent I I needed comfort in an area, there were things I didn't plan at all. Things I still don't plan at all, but some things I, you know, I, I track it down to the second. So. Yeah, we were definitely different and we're still very different. Uh, let's get into the main question. So let's, let's go ahead and jump in so we can explain these things to our listeners, what we mean by this, 
this concept of time management. And then we can go again, like we've been doing, we'll go through our tips on how to better or how to improve your time management skills. So first question, what does it mean when we say time management? Well, to me, it's in its simplest form. There is a finite number of seconds, a finite number of minutes in a day, right? And you're going to be awake and productive. That is accomplishing things for part of them. And then there are things on your plate that you have to, or really want to at least, or let's let's go a little further, things that might be a good idea for you to accomplish. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's simple arithmetic, right? There's only, you know, you subtract one for the from the other and see what's left over. So you won't have a lot of time to waste in between there. So how you allocate those free minutes is is what I say time management is. Yeah, time management is a concept. If you've taken managerial accounting, there's a concept in managerial accounting called the theory of constraint, which is, you know, how do you find out what product to produce based on whatever resources are constrained and what order do you do, do them? And it's the same thing. It's it's we have, like you said, a finite amount of time in a day. So how do you allocate that time to all the different things that either need to or you want to get done and also have time for things like sleep? and work and fun and all that kind of stuff. So that's time management. And there's so many different methods of time management. Uh, Jason, I know you were a big planner. We've said this before and you, you've said it on the podcast before. I know you were a big planner. To what level were you that big planner? Like when you say you're a big planner, explain to us and, and listeners, what level were you uh, at at that time or when you say you're a big planner? So, in comparison to some, I might not have been as big a planner. Sure. Like I, I didn't lay down a 30-day or 60-day or 90-day calendar and put things on it that way. But one day out, two days out, a week out as to what I had to do, I would always you know, make certain I put down those major things. And for me, I, I, school was such a – it was at the top of my list of priorities. It was school and then work and then a social life after that, right? And I'm not saying that's the best balance for everybody, but based on my situation, it, it was where I was and, and what I did. Right? So I would start with my school schedule and work backwards from there. And I would count the minutes till it took me to drive, say, to campus because when I was living off campus to parking and getting to class and then leaving there and how long it would take me to go get showered and get ready for work. Or, and I would always you know, fit in a few hobby things. Um, I, I was very adamant about always going to the gym. And those things, I, I made them fit. I made them work. But it took, because I worked so much, especially the last couple of years of college, I you know, it, that took up a large part of, part of my day, five or six days a week. And to balance that with school and life, it meant I was counting minutes. So each day I started out with a yellow sheet of paper, right? And every minute of every day almost was tracked it, just for that day I was in. And then the next day, that night beforehand, I would do the same thing again. And sometimes it would maybe extend two or three days out for the bigger events, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't fill in those days until I got closer. But when it comes to managing those free minutes in any given day, I took advantage of all of them, right? Down to, down to the, you know, down to the minute, right? Because I had everything measured. So you were, you were kind of, I guess what they call them block schedulers where you put the blocks it, in essence, you're a block schedule where you put the blocks on your schedule and it says, okay, I'm, during this time, I'm going to be doing this. And during this time, I'm going to be doing this. And like you said, you had the whole day filled up or two days filled up of what you're going to be doing at the different times. Absolutely. And I, you know, uh, back then we had more simple cellular telephones <laughs> as we called them back then. Um, and I would set my alarms, right. I'd, I'd follow it to the T. I, I knew when I had to leave, I knew how long it was going to take me. I knew if I was running behind that type of thing. Man, I was everything but that. I mean, I, you could have looked at my calendar when I was in college and it was completely blank. It didn't even have people's birthdays on it. I just didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't write things down. And I, like I said, I used to make that, that big mistake uh, of, oh, I'll remember it later. And I never do. Uh, to the point where, you know, I, I forgot. I remember when I was in undergrad, I forgot we had a test on one day. Completely just slipped my mind because I didn't have it written down. And I, you know, 
stupid me didn't check the syllabus either. But uh, I remember, you know, I, I'd overslept for one exam. That was a that was a rough one because I overslept for the exam, which the professor my again my dad was the dean of the school of business, and the professor uh, knew my dad obviously, and I was so afraid when I woke up and realized that I was late for the exam that he was going to go tell my dad. That was also, <laughs> that was one of the reasons why I didn't go to business straight away, you know, straight away out of, out of high school because I didn't want him to know everything, but then I ended up going over to business, but he didn't tell my dad at the time. So I got there. I mean, I raced to, to, to class, to his office actually to, to ask him, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I made a mistake. I overslept. Is there any way I can take the a makeup exam? And it, his in his class there, he had a policy where you can take a makeup exam. So it was no big deal. He said, sure, fine. And we set up a time. And matter of fact, it was that day. It was just later that day. And so I thought, okay, cool. I'm safe. I'm good. He didn't tell dad. I got everything planned out, you know. And so I go to my dad's office and I go sit in my dad's office just to chit chat, see how he's doing. And lo and behold, that professor walks by my dad's office, pokes his head in, looks at me and goes, hey, we missed you today at your, your, your test. And I thought, we just went over this. Like, you you didn't have to come in here and say this in front of my dad. <laughs> he we already, he we, intentionally told I mean, on you. He did. He just told on me in front of my dad. I'm like, oh, man, you really? That's how we were going to be? <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, I had to explain that one. I, I can... But I can relate to the professor in this one just by virtue of I wish I could tell somebody on my students sometimes oh, yeah, that who course. would care and correct their their activities. So, you know, make them study, make them show up, make them care a little bit more. So, yeah. And, and he knew the the I mean, he obviously knew the, the the relationship I had with my dad and my dad's focus on education. But, you know, there's also, he knew it was, I would, he knew I wasn't going to get in a ton of trouble. I was just going to get, you know, spoken to about it. And I was just like, oh man, that's why I raised up here. So you wouldn't do that. (laughs) Well, I can count on one hand, the number of class sessions I missed in my college career. You mean just miss, not just test, but just sessions alone? Class sessions. Holy crap. I'm, I'm fairly certain throughout all of college, through four years, I might have I'm, I might have missed five classes. Maybe I'm not certain. Oh, good. I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this, but so when I was in chemistry, I had I was taking OCHEM, and so for those who know chemistry, OCHEM is a two part class. So it's first semester, second semester class. So I had the OCHEM professor in the first semester. And I didn't show up to class on occasion, but she didn't, (laughs) but she didn't have an attendance policy. Like there was nothing that says you have to come this many times. You have to, if you come, if you, if you're absent this many days, you'll be docked this. What There was nothing like this. It was just, you know, here's the class. If you want to come, come, whatever. So I went through the semester, passed the class, not with the greatest grade, but I passed the class. And so here comes the second semester and I'm same teacher. She, she taught both first part and second part. And I'm sitting in her class, the first day of class. And I look at her, her syllabus and it says attendance policy. If you miss more than two days, you get docked a letter grade. And I thought, Ooh. holy cow, like what's the change? And so after the class was done, and, you know, all the students were leaving. I walked up to her because, I mean, you know, I was I didn't have a problem talking to teachers. I, I kept it cordial and, and we were pretty friendly. But I said, what happened? Because last semester you didn't have an attendance policy. This semester all of a sudden you do. And she said, I implemented that this semester for the first time for you. And I thought, oh, wow. buddy. And I, <laughs> man, I, I took a step back. I was like, oh, and I, honestly, part of me inside of me was like, would you please not tell all the other students that, you know, because they would <laughs> hate me. But yeah, she said, I implemented one for the first time because of you, because of the classes that you missed last semester. Wow. You got recognized for the absolute wrong reasons. (laughs) Absolutely. And I was like, okay, well, it's good to see you. I'll see you next class because I'm not missing (laughs) any of them. So (laughs) it was, it was a fun stuff. Like I said, it's, you know, I made my mistakes when I was, when I was going through college and that's why I wanted to, to do this podcast is because I want, I don't want students to make the same mistakes. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. I mean, in many ways I was good, uh, about some things, but I was so off base and 
lack knowledge in so many other other areas to be able to share some of the experiences I had, but also some of the information that I've acquired through experience over the years. It, I, you know, that's why I'm here. I mean, I equally, I think I annoyed my professors a great deal, especially early on. I followed my calculus professor back to his office every hmm. day after class and made, <laughs> made him do problems with me for another 30 <laughs> minutes after class. That's I was, awesome. I followed my biology professor to his lab after class, just trying to chat him up. And I could tell how annoyed he was with me and I because <laughs> I wouldn't leave him alone. And, and still, of course, every now and then you find the professors who really who really loved it and attached to you. And that mentor that I talked about, the yep. Cuban exile, he and I really hit it off. And like I said, I spent a lot of time um, with him and learned a lot from him just just by virtue of those those conversations. Well, you know, I, I have a feeling now that listeners are, they've been hopefully following us along this, this long, and I have a feeling like they're listening to us and going, you know what, that Jason, I, I really need to be more like him. And you know that AJ, I don't need to be anything like him. <laughs> He's teaching us all the things we don't need to be doing. Well, I think it might depend, you know, quality, of, quality of life, right? I, I think you, uh, if you, if you, if you value enjoyment of individual experience, right, I, I was, um, you know, one thing I always found out about myself, I'm not a high en- enjoyment person. Sure. I'm not a high, I don't get a ton of joy out of individual things I do. Like some other people just seem to really love to do things. With me, it's more after I've done it, I'm contented by it. And so that's the motivating factor to, to you know, relieve anxiety, to uh, just go for that s- stability, that stable contentment in, in what I've done. And, you know, so that's just one of those psychological things that we're, we're all different in that way and we all have different needs. But one thing about it, you can try one extreme. You can try the middle. You can try adjusting your schedule how you want to, managing your minutes to the best of your ability or what. And all of a sudden you might find something that really, really works for you. One of the things I've always been fascinated about are, are people that who never worked out before. They start doing things like um, triathlons or um, CrossFit or just ma- marathoning, something like that that requires exceptional amounts of time. And that is what gives them so much structure and their whole life changes afterwards. Because, you know, once again, there's this new motivating factor that just changes everything. And it adds time management elements. It it adds values elements. It may... It adds elements about what accomplishment it is and the contentment that comes from it and things like that. You know, it's interesting what you just said. Uh, uh, We say it in our camp for the purpose of our camp, but it can also be used in college in itself, especially if you go to college outside of your your city, outside of the city that you were were raised or you grew up in. And that is you can be whoever you want. If you are somebody who doesn't have structure or never had structure – When you start college, especially if you're in another city, you can change and become whoever you want because nobody really there knows who you are. Yeah. And or if you're somebody that's super structured and super focused on your your grades, you can start to relax because the expectation of you, oh, you're that that person is not there anymore. And so you have the full capacity to be able to become who you want, especially at the beginning of college, because you're rebranding yourself. I agree 100 uh, percent. Everything, every new environment, every new opportunity is a, a potential for rebirth. And some things will change out of necessity. I've, I've had to and have continually relaxed my dedication towards something or my obsessive nature towards something because honestly, I just have so much to do by comparison, right? Used to, there was this dichotomy of work in school and then a little bit of social life. And then now it's turned into a family, a more demanding work life, right? Also social elements by virtue of a very social wife, right? And kids type scenario. What I find is that a person like me ends up either becoming extremely anxious about all the things that are on their plate and not performing well, or which is the way I've done more of is to start doing things not to my fullest, you know, halfway doing things, you know, not putting my full effort into it. So ha- half the effort, half the outcome. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting with the, when you talk about your wife, I know 
because of my wife, I know what type of person you are because my wife is very similar to you. I think I'm very similar to your wife and my, my wife is very similar to you. Like it, it is amazing how opposites attract each other. And my oh, yeah, wife it is. just, just kind of a, a, a throwback to the last episode when we were talking about the balance. I, I went to my wife right before we started recording it and I asked her, well, I'm just going to come up to you. I want to get you on the episode. And so you can talk about your work school life balance. And her first words out of her mouth was what balance? Like I never had balance. Like it was, it was school and work. And I was like, Oh, well that's going to be the same thing if Jason does it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would have just doubled up on the team against you, AJ. Exactly. That, that wouldn't help. <laughs> well, let's get back on topic now uh, with time management. So I would say the biggest con about time management, ironically, is the amount of time it takes to really get that into a process where it's going to be useful for you. So what would you say are some pros that would compensate for that con about the time that it takes? So total productivity is one. I mean, you will, if you plan things out, accomplish more during that period of time. But I'll drop a con back at you. It can also create a level of anxiety if you're not careful, right? It will create an expectation that I need to accomplish all these things, but I don't. So what about you? What what's Yeah, I think if done properly, and we're actually going to get to that in the top tips, so one of my top tips. If it's done properly, I think it does the adverse of what you just said about the anxiety. It just it, if it's done correctly and you understand it, it can take away that stress and anxiety. And yeah. it also allows you to not forget so many stuff. Sure. Uh, one more con is like I say, like I face oftentimes today is I end up not being able to put enough effort into something to meet meet the quality standards that I'm looking for. And, you know, that hurts the contentment aspect on the other side, right? When the creative output isn't what you hope for. And and so that's a that's another aspect if of planning. Um, if you plan too much. But once again, it comes back to did you do it correctly? Right. Well, I think one of the biggest flaws for people when they start when they try to start doing this time management and trying to figure out ways it works for them. I think their biggest mistake is they assume that when they first start, they're going to be pros at it. And if it doesn't work, then naturally they're just going to quit. And to me, it's very similar. Again, we talked about this with the life plan, with the financial plan. When I tell people to do a budget, I tell them, don't don't expect it to be exact for at least three months. Three months is a, is about where you start seeing how things are supposed to be and your estimations uh, are a little bit more accurate. I remember when we first started doing our budget, our first one, I thought, yeah, we're a family of five. We're going to budget $500 for groceries for the month. Boy, was I wrong. Ooh, and yeah. No, yeah, I, I don't know what I was thinking. But it usually takes about three months. So I would imagine that your time management skills are going to take that time too. It's going to take that practice and that understanding. So really, I guess what I'm trying to say is cut yourself some slack in the very beginning so that you will continue to try to, to better your skills. Otherwise, you'll just quit. Yeah, I agree. That makes complete sense. Let's get into our top tips. Uh, I'll start. And my first one is, this is kind of me, um, because I love technology. And my first one is use technology to your advantage. And by that, I mean automate as many things as you can to take away the work of having to remember things. So anything that, you know, our cell phones today can, it's pretty much our life. And there's a lot of things in there we can do to automate it. And so instead of, for me, I don't have now, and again, my time management skills have become better now that I am, you know, a professor and I'm also married to somebody who is very good at time management. I have my morning routine and it's automated. It's not something that I have to make decisions on. It's not something that I have to figure out. It is automatically made and there's no question around it. There's no change. It's there. There's also some other things that you can do, uh, again, with your cell phone that you can automate things. Uh, I, at least I have a, an iPhone and they even have one app that's just really for automation. And it's just, it's really nice. There's a lot of things that you can do to, to automate. I have even got happy birthday texts automated. So when somebody's birthday, it just sends them a happy birthday text. I don't even have to think about it. And it's really fun because my, I have two younger brothers. And so when we have birthdays of our parents or uh, their anniversary or Mother's Day or Father's Day, 
I'm always the first one to send them a text because I have it set for 12 midnight and they can't figure out how I do it because they know I'm asleep. And so I'm the first one to get that. And so we always, we always joke that I'm the better son because I get the, the happy whatever's first. So automate. <laughs> there you go. Work, work, uh, work smarter, not harder, right? Absolutely. Well, for my tip, I guess, you know, we've talked that time management is all about planning, right? Well, I would say discipline is a really important thing in that primarily, if you're going to plan something, live up to it. Okay. Show up at that time. If you need to leave at a certain time, leave at that time. That means cutting conversation short. That means perhaps stopping work dead middle of what you're doing and going to the next thing. Now, I can understand that straying or varying if one thing is far more important than the other and something is fungible in your schedule, right? That you can say, okay, this isn't as important. I can, but you kind of have an idea of that ahead of time. But I see too often people who plan their day, they run behind all day. It's a constant source of stress, frustration, and things like that. So remaining disciplined to the plan you lay down Maybe not long-term, right? Things can change long-term without consequence, but in the moment, throughout the day as you're going through it, it's very difficult to make changes to the plan on the fly. So staying disciplined to the plan that you've laid down is important. Absolutely. And my second one kind of goes back to what I was saying with the biggest mistake. And uh, I'll say it this way. It's better to underestimate and overachieve than overestimate and underachieve. It's better to put less a little bit less than what you think you can accomplish on your schedule and do better than that, then put more than you think you can achieve. And then you fall short of that. Because if you fall short of that, then naturally you're going to think of it as a failure and you're less likely to stay consistent with it. So that would be my second one. That makes sense. Well, my second one uh, goes back to the whole planning aspect again. So if you know that some things are important, start with the cornerstones that can't change. Perhaps you need to go to this class. You need to be at work on this time, right? You need to take a test. Yes, you need to take a test or (laughs) you need to study for that test because otherwise you might as well not have taken the test, right? That's true. (laughs) So uh, to start with the more important things and walk backwards, if you can fit things in around that, I see people err on the side of, frivolousness all the time. They don't set aside the time to study or they don't plan for the big events, but they do do the other things. They'll they'll go to the coffee shop and sit there 30 minutes, you know, sipping a coffee or they rather than walking with it, or they will spend time playing a video game because they believe they have a few minutes or watching TV or getting vegged out on YouTube or Reddit or something like that, right? When that time is what is most fungible, right? You you should have focused on those cornerstone activities. So start with the most important things and walk backwards from there. That's yeah. Prioritizing was a struggle for me because I, my priorities tended to be not the right priorities uh, for my situation. My third one is understand the eighty twenty rule. Have you ever heard of the eighty twenty rule, Jason? Yeah, I have. Okay, good. But, uh, So the guy who created, he's an Italian economist, created it, Perito or Perito, I'm not sure how to say his name, but pretty much what he he observed is 80% of your outcome generally comes from 20% of your input. So 80% of what you get out of something generally comes from 20% of what you put into that, which is kind of counterintuitive. But if you think of it from a business perspective, typically if you break down a business, 80% of their revenues really generally come from 20% of what they do. The other stuff is just building. The other stuff is for one reason or another, it's, it may be, you know, adding that extra value to it, but 80% of it comes from really the 20. So if you focus in on that 20, then you can make that 80% the best it could be. All the other stuff is really just kind of fluff. And so you can take that into your school. You can take that into, I mean, think about it. I I didn't put it this way until I just said that, but 80% of my class grade is from 20% of really the, if you, if you were to say, okay, everything is equal, it's from 20% of the assignments, which are three tests. 
comes from 80%. It's just those three tests are worth more. So you can put that into anything. Yeah, that Pareto principle some, that holds true in some, some, some of the most strange scenarios, but uh, you'll find it in lots of research literature, not just not just uh, management or not just business, right? You'll Absolutely, find it in a yeah. lot of places. But it's one good way to, to think about that whole you know, aspect of prioritization and, and planning for what's most important. That's true. So did you have another one, AJ? I have one more tip I can talk about. Yeah, I have I have one more. And I th- I don't know if it's a if it's a blanket statement, but it really was necessary for me because again, ADD, ADHD, it was really tough for me if if I didn't do this one thing, you can pretty much hang it up. And that is don't multitask if possible. When you're scheduling stuff, when you're when you're doing stuff, don't assume that you can multitask because what you're doing is you're creating distractions. And you can only, the human mind can only focus in on one thing at a time. So when you're scheduling yourself, make sure you're, you're scheduling individual tasks for that time so you can really focus in on that time. That way you're not wasting time going from one to the other. I could not agree more, right? I've, I've never been someone who could effectively multitask. I have to have to dedicate myself wholly to what I'm doing if I want to do even a halfway decent job. So I uh, agree. I agree totally. My last tip is um, I told you I used electronic tools, right? Um, mm-hmm. Things like alarms and timers and, you know, just keeping up with things on the, on the clock. That's important, right? The calendar function today is just a game changer for people in terms of scheduling things and productivity. As you proceed in life, you know, I would say it becomes more important. It's more and more difficult to live without. But I'm a, still a huge proponent of the checklist. Oh, you yeah. know, you hear a lot about checklists for tasks and, and processes that you need to follow. There's a really a good book out there by a prominent surgeon named uh, Atul uh, Adewande, I think is is how you would say his name, the checklist manifesto. And it's it's focused on um, efficiency and proficiency by using checklists so you don't do things wrong, right? Well, for myself, the checklist of having things I wanted to accomplish during the day, one, a checklist allows you to easily prioritize things, okay? And when you use that in conjunction with these electronic tools like your calendar and stuff like that, that but something about having that paper checklist in front of you all day long and the satisfaction that comes from checking something off or lining something out that you've completed and moving on to the next, at least for me, extremely fulfilling. It feels like I use my time to the best of my ability. So that being said, I'm a huge proponent of that. If you haven't ever tried it, try it. Regular piece of paper, get yourself a, a cheap notebook or a nice notebook. Uh, I'm a big fan of of um, the Moleskin notebook. I still use those every day. Create yourself the checklist. Move down it on a daily basis. It'll 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 change things for you. As miserable as I was with my time management skills, checklists were a big thing for me. Because if I can put on a checklist, okay. like you said, I was I was somebody who used that as the challenge of can I get these done. Whereas if I didn't have that checklist, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. And I didn't, I didn't have that challenge. So when I need something done, done, and it's a high priority, I use a checklist a lot. So yeah, it almost reminds me of that graduation speech from the, and I don't know the guy's name, but who talked about um, uh, making your bed in the morning and the importance of making your bed. I think that was Admiral McRaven, wasn't yeah, it? I knew he was, I knew he was high up in the military, the armed services, but couldn't remember exactly who he was. But that was one of the best speeches I have ever heard and the importance of something so small and what we think of as insignificant and the impact it's going to have throughout the day. And, you know, you're talking about checking off the list, your, your checklist and how it gives you that satisfaction of you've, you've accomplished something. I think a lot of times we take for granted celebrating small victories and something as small as making your bed is that first small victory of the day. That's going to set the precedent for the rest of the, the, the day. That's a great point. Well, that's an awesome episode, and we actually stayed right around the actual time we needed to. So uh, next episode, we are going to start on another series. And again, we're, we're putting pauses on these series because we want to start introducing you to these series, and then we're going to start coming back to them. 
Uh, but we are going to be starting with our senior college series. So this is really the, the stuff that is dealing with upper level college students. So if you're an upper level, this is specifically for you. If you're going into college, this is still something that's very important for you because you will be there soon, hopefully. And in chapter one, we're just going to really be focusing on the senior year. Uh, hopefully you're not getting senioritis. So Jason, before we leave, you got any parting words? Just remind everybody that please get your comments to us, get your questions to us, share your experiences with us. We're here for you. We want to talk about what interests you. Awesome. Well, until next time, y'all have a good one. We'll see you later. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Reschooled Podcast. Be sure to head over to reschooled.com for news and other information on things we're getting into.